Many times we need to keep our health in check, but don't know what questions to ask or where to begin. We walk in blindly to our health care provider and walk out none the wiser and maybe even more confused than before. Can you take charge of your health and arm yourself with the questions and preparedness you need? The answer is yes. Welcome to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. This program will answer your questions and give you the best practices for facing your medical partner in good health. Now, here's Dr. Susan Downs. This is Susan with Occupy Health. Today we're going to be speaking with Dr. Philomena Trindati about the importance of stable blood sugars and diabetes. The Occupy movement has been popular to give citizens control over elements we felt we had little control over. In Occupy Health, we're taking back our health. Dr. Trindati's mantra is, what's the cause of this condition? What are the antecedents? What are the triggers and modifying events? I don't know about you, but when my body's not working, I want to know why. I want to know what to do about it. That is why we are here. We're taking back our health, and the first step is knowledge. Philomena Trindati, who is an MD and MPH, is an international sought-after speaker in functional medicine. She is a graduate of the Fellowship in Anti-Aging, Regeneration, and Functional Medicine, and teaches in the Fellowship, which is a master's program through the University of Southern Florida, as well as she teaches in the Institute of Functional Medicine. After obtaining her bachelor's degree in biology, she went on to finish a master's in public health in the area of environmental health and epidemiology before starting medical school. She graduated first in her class in family practice from the University of California Davis School of Medicine and did her residency training in family practice at UC San Francisco slash Santa Rosa program. She's been in clinical practice for over 16 years. Before starting her own practice in 2004 in functional medicine, she was the medical director of a nonprofit organization that's catered to the underserved. She's currently very active in developing teaching programs in functional medicine in the U.S., Latin America, and Europe. She's also starting a service to help healthcare pr- practitioners who want to learn and use the functional medicine approach. But we'll do, deal with more of this at the end of our show. First question is, what is diabetes? Well, diabetes is really uh, not just someone who has obese and has diabetes, but it's basically anyone who has insulin resistance, prediabetes, diabetes, and any of the conditions that go along with it. Uh, because, you know, in, in other words, insulin resistance is associated with many other conditions, such as, for example, sleep apnea, polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we, we often think of diabetes meaning, well, you're obese and you have diabetes or any of the sort of diabetes spectrum conditions um, because we've learned, I feel like, in general a lot about diabetes and maybe even prediabetes, but we haven't had as much focus on insulin resistance, which is basically the sort of underlying root cause and how that is what increases our risk. It's all about the insulin, the elevated insulin levels in type 2, um, sort of the type 2 spectrum of diabetes that actually is a big culprit. So really diabetes is looking at obesity and insulin resistance or any of the other related conditions that go along with insulin resistance, for example. Can you tell me how insulin plays in diabetes and what is insulin resistance? So insulin resistance is basically what happens in type 2 diabetes. So the pancreas secretes insulin. In type 2 diabetes, we have an overproduction of insulin. So the first uh, thing that happens is you start to have too much insulin being produced by the pancreas, but it doesn't work. It's an insulin that can't get inside the cell. The pancreas doesn't know that, so it continues to increase more insulin production because it sees that blood sugar is now rising. But that insulin is defective in a sense and it can't get inside the cell. So your problem is that you have too much insulin, but it's not able to do its work because it can't get inside the cell. And so let me the take, question oh, is, yeah, let me take a step back. So my understanding in diabetes is you have sugar that goes into the blood and then in response, the pancreas secretes insulin which takes the sugar to where it belongs. Is that correct? Correct. So the insulin helps the sugar get uptaken into the cell and work, right? Into the muscle and in an attempt to do its work. Okay. But the insulin has to be able to go inside the cell 
to signal the cell to then use the sugar. So insulin resistance means that the insulin cannot get into the cell? Exactly. And there's Uh, been a lot of questions and sort of a lot of literature and a lot of theories about why that happens. We used to think that predominantly in type 2 diabetes, what happened is that most of those patients had too much fat and that it was in the fat cell that insulin resistance began. Now we have different theories, and, and the one that I follow the most is the one that was developed by Barbara Corky, who's a great researcher and has looked into this quite extensively. And she says that really the main cause of insulin resistance is begins in the pancreas. So basically there's an insult to the pancreas, and then we can talk about what that insult can be, and the pancreas starts to, to secrete too much insulin, but that insulin is defective and can't do work. And so you're not able to have the insulin go inside the cell to then signal, you know, sort of elicit all the signals that it's supposed to so that the glucose or the sugar can be uptaken. So let absorbed. me understand. Diabetes 1 and diabetes 2. Diabetes 1 is where you just don't have insulin at all and you have to take it to get your sugars working. Diabetes 2 is you have some insulin, but it's not working. You might not need to take insulin. And there's all sorts of variations in between. Is that correct? Correct. Yes, exactly. Okay. So, okay. So it used to be that fat was, you know, we associated uh, obesity and fatness with diabetes. But you're saying that's no longer the case? For example, I understand like... 30, there's a good uh, 30% of the people with normal weight, at least, who are di- diabetic and type 2. So is that exactly. correct? Absolutely. So, and that comes from the National Haynes data, which has shown that, you know, of the people who have a normal BMI, so they are not overweight and they're not obese, about 30% of them will be insulin resistant. And we're not diagnosing those patients early enough because if we do, diagnose insulin resistance early, it can be reversed before anyone ever develops diabetes. So this is sort of a continuum, if you will, you, where you have uh, insulin resistance sort of in the beginning, the beginning stages of the problem, and if it's not taken care of, it continues to increase, so the pancreas continues to make more and more insulin. Eventually, you sort of out, outrun or the pancreas can no longer uh, produce sufficient insulin to keep the blood sugar normal, and then you can you have develop what's called impaired glucose tolerance. That means you can't keep your blood sugar normal, particularly your fasting blood sugar. And if you keep going, then you're diagnosed with prediabetes. If you keep going along the continuum, then you're diabetes. But the real problem is the insulin resistance, which in most cases is not being addressed because most traditional doctors are waiting for someone to become diabetic because then we have treatments, or even pre-diabetic. But my whole thing is, the earlier we can diagnose it, the easier it is to reverse. I mean, you you can even reverse some some cases of type 2 diabetes, and I've seen it happen in my patients, but the earlier we can diagnose the insulin resistance, the easier it becomes. So we can be walking around totally normal with nice blood sugars and fasting at 75, and we could be insulin resistant and on this pathway toward diabetes. Absolutely. If you never check the insulin level, and in particular an insulin level after a high sugar meal, you may never know. Wow. So we could all be on this pathway. And you say it's a continuum. It's being you know, insulin resistance and then poor control over our sugars and then uh, pre-diabetes where sugars start going up and then until we get to diabetes. That's interesting. Correct. So yeah, and the, the real interesting part, Susan, I find is that the majority of Patients that we're now seeing may never become diabetic, but they're suffering the same consequences because they're along that continuum, but they may not be diagnosed because most doctors are waiting for someone to be diabetic. I mean, that happened to my best friend. Uh, She was diagnosed with prediabetes and happened to call me and tell me, and I said, oh, it was fatty liver and prediabetes is what she got diagnosed with. And I said, so what's your doctor doing? Because that's completely reversible. And she said, well, we're just watching it to make sure I don't develop diabetes. And I said, but the important thing is that we can reverse it, and the earlier we look for it, the better. Because just like you mentioned, she happened to already have some abnormal blood sugars after meals, but you can have a completely normal blood sugar, 75, 80, for example, fasting, 
and have insulin resistance. It's just not progressed enough where you can see it with a fasting blood sugar and not know unless you're checking your fasting and your insulin after meals. Because the first insulin that goes up is actually the one after meals. So we can be totally normal, our sugars look normal, and we're having damage done by uh, abnormal sugar levels. So do sugar spikes and sugar dips, how do they affect our health? Well, sugar, both, both sugar spikes and sugar dips can affect our health. If you spike your blood sugar, for example, that's considered sort of an insult to your body. Our body, in a sense, goes into stress, so we make more of the stress hormones. You can also have what's called advanced glycated end products, which means that the sugar becomes a free radical, if you will, right? It can bind. Um, it, it, be, it tries to get, the, it, to get stabilized because it needs electrons, in a sense, to become more stable. And so it can go around and damage your fats and eventually your proteins, and um, that causes more inflammation in the body, and it sets off this whole process of inflammation. On the other hand, if you're low, if you have dips, that can also affect particularly our brain and our nervous system as well, and inflammation too, because our body really likes balance. It likes equilibrium. It likes to maintain balance. So anything that disrupts it is an insult to the body. Yeah, I read somewhere that each spike of blood sugar and each dip, it insults the brain and can set off a, uh, a cascade of inflammation and brain damage. Sounds yeah, like exactly. it's something we, we need to be careful cells. of. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so somebody's having these abnormal that. sugars. You say even though uh, their the doctor's measurements are normal, what risk does this pose to the body? I mean, what damage is this doing? Well, the, the thing is that you can have a lot of damage being done to your blood vessels. You can have increased uh, thickness of your um Blood vessels, so you can have cardiovascular disease, for example, happening even with some normal numbers. So we need to be looking for sort of better measures because if you're just looking at blood sugar and, as we just said, that it can be normal, we need to be sort of, in, in a sense, educating our health care providers that there's earlier markers that we want to look at because by the time our blood sugars go up, you may have already had a lot of damage done to your blood vessels and have, you know, cardiovascular risks go up because the, if you sort of look at in terms of what is your risk of cardiovascular disease, you know, we know that an elevated hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of glycation, so of times when your blood sugar is fluctuating, is more sort of um, precise or a better indicator of cardiovascular disease than a cholesterol, for example. And so we need to be looking for those earlier markers because they're much better indicators. Okay. Yeah, uh, what you're telling me, because my, my reading tells me, like, with diabetes, you've got four times the risk of a stroke, three times the risk mm-hmm. of a heart attack, maybe four to five times the risk of Alzheimer's. So you're saying these risks are the same percentages even before your sugars look abnormal to the doctor's? Yeah, I'm saying patients with, what the literature shows us is patients with pre-diabetes, so they may have erratic increased uh, sugar levels, but not enough to be considered diabetics, they are four times more likely to die of heart disease, and um, three to four times more likely to have a stroke. But those are the same risks that we suffer when we're diabetic. So pre if you look at patients who are pre-diabetic and those who are diabetic, they basically have the same risk when it comes to strokes and heart disease. But unfortunately, we're waiting until they're diabetic for them to be addressed. So this is a great area where we can do a lot of prevention. So what, okay, so the listener out there, what can he do to measure to see where on this continuum he lies? So you can measure... A fasting insulin, for example. Uh, you also want to measure a postprandial, so a, a insulin after someone has eaten a high sugar meal, usually a high sugar meaning 75 grams of sugar, for example, uh, which is actually not necessarily sugar. It can be, you know, a bagel and uh, a glass of orange juice and maybe some jelly on that bagel. That maybe that's enough to increase it 
um, to the point above those 75 grams, which is a test that we use to see what happens, you know, how does the pancreas respond? Um, you also want to do a hemoglobin A1C. So this measures the amount of sugar that is bound to the hemoglobin in our blood so that has sort of fought off oxygen or has competed, you know, with oxygen. Um, you can also measure adiponectin. So adiponectin is a measure of um, sort of how healthy you are in a sense, and it, it tends to decrease before insulin increases. So it's a earlier marker that we see as adiponectin levels fall, we know that insulin starts to increase. Um, and in addition, sometimes looking at these laboratory values really gives us a lot of information. But I also like to consider what sort of things, so what sort of diagnoses are associated with having high insulin levels that people don't often think about. But the underlying root cause, as we like to talk about in functional medicine, is associated with insulin resistance. Things like, for example, polycystic ovarian syndrome, which we're seeing more and more cases of, and in women that are normal weight, women who are not overweight. And sleep apnea, for example. Most patients who have sleep apnea are insulin resistant, and it just hasn't been diagnosed. So all those things that we talked about, your adiponectin, your hemoglobin A1C, your fasting, and your postprandial insulin levels, as well as the proinsulin. You can also look at proinsulin, which is a marker of the pancreas trying to put out that insulin so fast that it does it prematurely, and you can measure that in the blood. So associating what uh, conditions people have with that um, can give you an idea of whether or not they may be insulin resistant. Another one that I didn't mention is most people who have or have had cancer in the past also tend to be insulin resistant. Uh, and those that also diagnose with a fatty liver, you know, I have a lot of patients that come to see me and say, oh, my, my doctor told me I have a fatty liver. And their liver enzymes, you know, their liver function may be completely normal, but they have did a, an ultrasound or had some kind of a study that showed there was fat deposition in the liver that's highly associated also with insulin resistance. So I think it's important to look at the lab, but also see maybe do any of our listeners have some of those conditions that we know can be associated with insulin resistance, even though it has never been diagnosed or sort of brought to the light. Hmm. Interesting. One thing I noticed in my studies is that um, I've read that there are two surges of insulin after you eat a meal. That's postprandial is after a meal. And that the first surge prevents your sugars from going way up. And the second surge brings the sugar levels down. So when you're very, one of the things, if you're beginning on this pathway toward diabetes 2 or something called uh, diabetes 1.5, which we can discuss later, um, the first thing that will happen is your sugars go up after a meal, but the second surge of insulin can bring those sugars down fairly normally. So you can have very high sugars beyond the start of that path, and in the morning your fasting glu- glucose levels look normal. So after a meal, I would think, is a very sensitive measure, much more than the early morning glucose level. Absolutely, and, and there's lots of literature on that. Um, but unfortunately, you know, there's, we still um, haven't instituted that as being sort of your standard of care or the normal thing that you would measure. Uh, because uh, one other thing too that we know is we our meal after meal our sugars of course spike just like you mentioned. But we also know that what is in that meal can affect how that spike, how long it lasts, and how high it goes. But I think that the one thing that um, we should all be doing for our patients, and a lot of our colleagues still are not, is looking at insulin and not just at the blood sugar and particularly looking at it after meal. That is essential. Why are doctors not doing this? Well, I think two main reasons. I think, number one, um, maybe when they were, in, they were in practice, when they were first in learning medicine, they were not taught. And sometimes it's hard to break old habits. You're so used to doing things one way and, and you continue to do it that way. Um, and I think the other uh, reason, too, is that I don't believe it. the literature is out there, but I don't believe that enough emphasis has been put on it. You know, there's this whole belief that once a discovery is made, you know, a scientific discovery is made, that it takes about 15 to 25 years for it to be implemented in clinical practice. 
And some of that is because, you know, people are uh, sort of unsure or they want more studies or they want more proof. But I, I believe that that's not the whole picture. I think a lot of it is that it's hard for people to change in general, even when we want to change, even when we know that we need to do it. It's difficult. So it's, it's sort of a we're, we're kind of fighting human nature in a way. So I think we have both of those working towards us. Number one, that people are ingrained in the way they did things and they continue to do them the same way. And they are not always sort of going to co- conferences like you constantly do, for example, and are educating themselves and trying to really practice, you know, state of the art. What is science proven? Um, and the other thing is that uh, many of uh, for the laboratories and other institutions have not changing the, have not changed their norms. They haven't really started emphasizing that. And I think medical education hasn't either in terms of what's being taught in medical school. That is again usually fifteen to twenty five years behind, you know, what the scientific findings are. That is exactly why we have this program, listeners. We want you to take this information so we can be a little bit ahead of the curve. But you, well, speaking of curves and lab values, aren't they based on like 95% of the population, which in our country is largely obese and doesn't have very good health? So if we're normal by those standards, is that something to be proud of? That brings up a whole other issue, which is uh, lab values and what they were originally sort of developed to test, and that those are reference points, right? Anytime we do a laboratory evaluation, those are reference ranges, and they can be huge. And so you have to look at why those reference ranges were developed and how they were developed, because you can be in the reference range and then are considered normal, but not be normal, because you can be close to one end or the other. And, um, you know, a, a long time ago, I was taught that we, in the United States, first of all, we have a very disease sort of driven model, right? It's whether or not you have this disease. And in, in most industrialized nations. So what, when you have a complaint and you go to the doctor, they're looking at do you or don't you have this diagnosis? So it's very diagnosis driven. But when you look at those reference ranges and how they were developed, they were developed to detect disease. And when you look at, well, what's the definition of disease when you're considering function, when you're looking at how is my body functioning or how is each organ functioning? And so I was taught that disease is about 25% of normal function. So you can be 75% of normal, you can be 50% of normal, not have a disease, but have a dysfunction, but they will not show in the laboratory ranges because those ranges were sort of developed to detect disease. And I feel that that's one of the reasons why so many of my patients have multiple complaints and have been to multiple doctors and were told there's nothing wrong with you or we can't find anything because they're looking at those ranges that were designed to detect disease, not dysfunction. And that's to, for me, that's where functional medicine has become so important because it's really looking at function. How is each organ functioning in and of itself and how are they all functioning together, right? And what is optimal function and can we you know, determine whether or not each person or each organ is down, developing normal function? And if it's not, then why? What's the underlying root cause or root causes so we can try and work backwards and either stop the progression or reverse it altogether? Wow, that's kind of enlightening. I mean, we could all be walking around with insulin resistance, not know we have it without asking the right questions. So how do we get this insulin resistance? In 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 other words, how is it developed? Yeah, we've got about two and a half minutes before break, so we can start on what causes insulin resistance. So I follow the the school of thought of um, Barbara Corky, and in 2011, she won the American Diabetes Association Lecturer of the Year Award or the Researcher of the Year Award for her work. And what she said is that, um, you know, we really need to look at each individual person and figure out how insulin resistance developed in that person, but that there's some basic foundations and basic rules that we need to follow and that um, the insulin resistance really begins in the pancreas, in the cell, which is a pancreatic beta cell, that makes insulin. And that there's a lot of things 
that can damage a pancreatic beta cell, many of which are in our processed foods. And she actually, uh, in 2014, published a major article that um, says, what are we putting into our food that are making us fat and some resistant? And what she says is it's, there's many things that can cause damage to the pancreatic beta cell that then increases the insulin production because that's how sort of the cell knows how to respond, but it's dysfunctional insulin and that's what causes insulin resistance. So too much insulin being produced or hyperinsulinemia causes insulin resistance. And she talks about toxins, but also a lot of food additives, things are being put into our prepackaged food that causes damage to that beta cell in addition to other toxins like your persistent organic pollutants, your heavy metals, for instance, uh, some of the detergents that we use. And then she also mentions other things that can cause that, such as food sensitivities or food allergies. And then I've taken her list and I've looked at the literature and added a few more things to that that I know can make someone insulin resistant, like lots of stress, for example, whether it's you know emotional stress or even physical stress. I'm sorry to interrupt, but we're coming to a break now. But we certainly want to hear more about these toxins and things that do lead us down this path toward insulin resistance, which leads us down a very unhealthy path. More in a minute, folks. You are listening to Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs. We'd love to hear from you about today's show. Send your email to Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. That's Dr. Susan at OccupyHealth.com. Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back to Occupy Health. We we're with Dr. Philomena Trindati, and she is telling us about what leads us down this ugly path toward insulin resistance, which leads us down to all sorts of ugly consequences, perhaps responsible for most of the chronic diseases we're suffering in this country. It's interesting, only recently it's uh, stated that the U.S., uh, we are dying earlier than we had in the past. So this could be a big part of this puzzle. So I'm uh, returning to Dr. Trindati, who will discuss what gets us on this path to insulin resistance. So I have mentioned a few things. Uh, I'm going to reiterate. So things like ins- to develop insulin resistance, for example, those the root causes or things that can lead us down that pathway are toxins, for example, and all the different types of of toxins, such as, you know, your heavy metals, as well as your persistent organic pollutants, but also meaning food additives, your um, food sensitivities or food allergies, but also changes in the gut microbiome. That has been, you know, big, sort of the latest kid on the block in a sense, but large, large, large amounts of information showing us how that is a big contributor to insulin resistance. So changes in your gut bugs, leading to insulin resistance. But we also have things like nutrient deficiencies as well as prescription drugs. You know, many of the prescription drugs that are used on a regular basis with our patients can lead to insulin resistance, like the statins, which are used to lower your cholesterol, for example, or your PPIs, your proton pump inhibitors. Those can also lead to insulin resistance, just to mention a few. And there's blood pressure medications that can also do the same. And But I believe that many of sort of the uh, lifestyle factors can also lead there, like your lack of sleep. You know, people who sleep six hours a night instead of eight hours can develop insulin resistance just from the lack of sleep. And things like nutrient deficiency, so maybe not able to either digest our food or chew properly or then absorb our food in our intestines can also lead to insulin resistance. This is interesting. Our previous two speakers had mentioned the role of the gut in heart disease and brain disease. It seems that these all are interconnected. And who would have thought the gut is so important in our health and that it's so sensitive to the choices we make in our life? I understand even stress and, you know, certain things can, or even uh, cell phones might affect the microbiome and how our gut responds. So, uh for example, I understand that the statins decrease this thing you discussed called adiponectin, and that's how they can lead to uh, insulin resistance. Is that correct? Yes, yeah. There may be more than one, but that is one way that we know they do it, for sure. And, you know, the doctors are handing these pills out thinking that these are great, but you're talking even the antacids that we take for our, our acid reflux, those cause a problem with the gut? Yes, they can because they can change the gut microbiota. So they change the good protective gut bugs 
and that can then lead to insulin resistance. And what happens when we change the bugs in the gut? What, what, what's the process? So basically, uh, there's been lots of literature written about this, and in uh, last year, an article came out that sort of looked at all the latest to try and figure out the, what it has the most um, sort of support for how does it work. And there's basically three different ways uh, in which changes in the gut bugs, and the good gut bugs, or the gut microbiome, or the gut microbiota, um, does this. And those three main ones is, number one, it's by what's called the lipopolysaccharide layer. So every, uh, so the, our normal um, bacteria have a cell wall, whereas we have cell membranes. And we're constantly having bacteria that is breaking down or that our body is killing, our immune system is fighting off. And this lipopolysaccharide, which you can look at as sort of a toxin in their cell walls, is being released. And normally our body is able to deal with it. But that's a very um, pro-inflammatory factor that was called the lipopolysaccharide. What we know now is that in the presence of a very unhealthy or a high-fat, high-sugar diet, our body is not able to handle the lipopolysaccharide, so the toxin that's released from the bacteria, and that then causes inflammation and insulin resistance through this sort of very long and and, um, a little bit complicated process. The other way is that normally our gut bacteria takes down the fibers that we eat and breaks them down into what's called short-chain fatty acids. And there's three main short-chain fatty acids, one of which actually feeds the good bacteria in our colon, and then two others that help us absorb nutrients from food. And when we're not eating sufficient fiber, so when we have a very low fiber diet, which is very typical in the U.S., unfortunately, then our bacteria is not able to make those short-chain fatty acids. So it's not able to feed the good gut bugs, and it also makes more of the other two short-chain fatty acids that can actually glean more energy from our food, unfortunately, and create more inflammation. So how did you... Genetic- way- oh, so, I'm sorry. Yes. So, okay. The third way is by the fact that our t- the good gut bugs are able to take our bile acids, which you know, are, are uh, constantly being made, and then conjugate them and make them into secondary um, bile acids, which are actually protective and help decrease inflammation. But when you don't have sort of those, the right gut microbiota, then you're not able to do that. So we end up being sort of inflamed through several different processes. Now, there's one other thing here, and that is that I talked about food additives, but many of the food additives are actually damaging, directly damaging to the good gut bugs, like high fructose corn syrup, for example, and all the non-caloric sweeteners. Many other food additives that are added to prepackaged food to either make it taste good or uh, make its uh, shelf life, you know, be longer, also can damage. Uh, it's actually toxic to the good bacteria in our gut so that we're not able to have sufficient numbers. And then we're not able to reproduce if we're not eating the proper things in our diet. So how do genetically modified foods and gluten and processed oils fit into this? So genetically uh, modified foods can, number one, we're we're not exactly sure everything that they can do to our bodies, for example, but they in of themselves can be very inflammatory and can damage the gut microbiota to begin with. uh, On the other hand, some of the additives that we're adding to our foods can be directly, you know, they can directly be toxic to the pancreatic beta cell. So now we have more than one way in which it can affect insulin resistance. So a lot of these are damaged to the pancreas itself as well as to the gut microbiota. So it's in a sense, I call this a double whammy. High fructose corn syrup, for example. We know and gluten, another example, and the non-caloric sweetener such as NutraSweet and Splenda. We know that they can damage the pancreatic beta cell directly and increase their over insulin resistance, but they can also damage the gut microbiota, the good gut bugs that normally protect us. Okay, wow. Very interesting. Uh, two former speakers also mentioned inflammation, which seems to come up quite often when t- talking about disease processes. So Absolutely. how do we increase our sensitivity to insulin? Well, we can, we, it, it, number one, um, by our food, by the food that we put in our mouth, 
And number two, by our lifestyle, by what we do. And number three, I always say, by the thoughts that we think. So that's sort of my baseline approach. So number one, we can increase fibers and feed our gut microbiota. And we know that within 24 hours of changing our diet and eating a sort of more Mediterranean-type diet, that's a diet that was tested, but by Mediterranean, we mean a diet rich in fish, for example, and uh, olive oil and lots of polyphenols, lots of antioxidants and very high in vegetables and very colorful. So lots of color like the rainbow, so to speak. Um, And so when we change that within 24 hours, we can already see a change in the gut microbiota. And that is actually sort of the most important or the biggest thing we can do. We can also add some of the probiotics, some of the gut the gut bugs that we know can actually decrease inflammation and some that are supposed to be there anyway that we know can be um, sort of bringing balance back into the gut microbiome. Because, you know, when I first started talking about changes in the gut microbiome, everybody thought, oh, that means I have an infection. And no, it doesn't mean you have an infection. We have a dysbiosis. We have an, a disequilibrium or an unbalance in the good gut bugs that are supposed to be there to protect us. You know, that's part of our immune system. So it's not necessarily that we have an infection. We just have abnormal numbers or not enough of the good guys or an imbalance between um, sort of the, the ones that are protective to our organism. So we can also take a probiotic, but really far and we, Far and beyond, uh, the most important thing is by what we do with our food. But also, too, the fact that we realize that when we increase our fiber, and I usually have my patients eat 35 grams of fiber per day, um, when we do that, things with, like flaxseed, for example, and chia seeds and uh, coconut flour, as well as you know, all your vegetables are also fibrous. Just by doing that, we can already you know, make a big difference in our gut microbiome. We can take those probiotics, as I mentioned. In addition, we can try and avoid all the food preservatives, all the things that we know are damaging to the gut microbiome, such as the non-caloric sweeteners that I mentioned and your high fructose corn syrup, which is, you know, in this country, it's really difficult to buy sort of any prepackaged uh, juice, for example, or any prepackaged food that doesn't contain either any of those non-caloric sweeteners such as NutraSweet or Saccharin or Splenda, um, but also high fructose corn syrup. You know, I travel a lot, and when I'm on a plane, basically the only thing I can drink are, is water, and I can do sparkling water or regular water. And up until now, I think I can drink tomato juice because so far it doesn't contain high fructose corn syrup. But I'm continuously reading the label because it seems like it's being added to almost every drink, including, you know, like your 100% orange juice. In many cases, that also has high fructose corn syrup. So it's a matter of what can we sort of put in and add to our diet that will help protect um, our gut microbiome, but also, too, what do we need to avoid? Because in many cases, we may be exposed to, to what's considered toxic or to toxins that affect the gut microbiota and not really know. Things like uh, some of the detergents we may use or the creams or the uh, skin care line that you may be using, as well as many of the air fresheners. You know, now we can't even step into a hotel room and e- even the airport, for example, without having those aromatizers that actually spray, you know, different scents into the air. All those things can be toxic to our pancreas, our pancreatic beta cells, as well as our gut microbiota. Wow. Uh, very interesting. So how do we measure uh, how, what our toxin load is? Oh, that's not an easy one to do, Susan. Um, there are some, some tests out there that we can use. I think first and foremost, we have to really focus on our history and look at each patient um, individually and, you know, really personalize it to the sort of life that they've led. You know, what has their exposures been up until now? You know, where have they lived and uh what have they done? You know, I had a patient, for example, that um, I was trying to figure out, you know, why he's insulin resistant and what has happened to him so far. And when I dug back deep enough, it turns out that he used to fish as a very young boy with his father, and he made his own weight, you know, for his fishing pole. And those are made with uh, with uh, mercury. And um, that it was... Um, 
actually they, they used lead and some mercury. They could do a mixture. Some people use more lead. And that they would, um, he would use his teeth to, grow, to um, sort of get it down and smash down in the right uh, proportion where he could then wrap it around his um, fishing wire. Um, I'm, I'm blanking on what's that called. Uh, the, it's not wire, but you know what I'm talking about, the uh, fishing line. And so I was astonished that that, you know, those are things that accumulate. Those are heavy metals accumulate in our body. And so we have to look for them. Um, and then, you know, we know for cisne organic pollutants or another, uh, they can do the same thing. For example, we have a, a great study out of Italy on the, called the Savesco Women's Study. And Savesco, Italy was a, a town where they had the biggest explosion and exposure to dioxin, which is a pollutant that persists in the air and we know can lead to insulin resistance and, uh, or it increases your risk of insulin resistance. And so we have a study from there showing that the women who were the youngest at the time the exposure happened, which was in 1976, and also who were closest to the area where the explosion happened, have the highest rate of insulin resistance and diabetes, uh, and it's been tied to their exposure. And other toxins, we know that there's increased, so there's, the toxins increase your probability of developing insulin resistance, but in some we can actually show cause, which is not easy. So, for example, on the polychlorinated biphenyls or PCBs, we know that that's also one type of a persistent organic pollutant. We can actually show causation. We can show that there, it, it actually directly correlates or it causes insulin resistance. And, you know, the thing is, for almost every toxin, there is a way to measure it with some difficulties. You know, we've, in the last 10 years, we've developed a lot more tests to be able to ascertain the levels of toxins in our patients. But I think, first of all, we have to really be really complete in our history and try and figure out what were the exposures that that patient has had so far, because otherwise it's sort of looking like a, for a needle in a haystack that leads us then to try and figure out, okay, what do I look for? What tests do I order? For example, and I what see about a lot mercury of in the teeth? That's mercury a very in good our point. fillings. I think Europe has banned that there's not going to be mercury in the fillings for people under age 15. So is, exactly. is mercury a risk in our teeth? Oh, mercury is a big risk, and it's one that uh, is often dismissed. You know, it, it never ceases to amaze me how um, I know in medical school and in residency, and I'm sure you've had the same thing happen, Susan, whenever we broke one of those thermometers, because we used to use, <laughs> you know, the mouth thermometers that were mercury thermometers, we had to, uh, you know, completely block off that area. And nobody could go near it because that was toxic. But yet we have fillings in our mouth that are mercury and they're constantly, you know, releasing mercury. And yet that's not considered a toxin. You know, it's Same with fluoride. Uh, fluoride is considered a toxin. They have to consider hazardous race, waste along with mercury, yet they put mercury Absolutely. and fluoride in their mouths. Yeah. Go figure. Exactly. You mentioned something it, it, uh, in a previous conversation about arsenic and rice, like a half cup of rice would give us, um, you know, uh, the, the maximum over, recommended yeah. dose of arsenin, arsenic per yeah, day? Yeah, exactly. So the arsenic is used not just uh, because I was talking, I was going to talk about pesticides. And so arsenic is used not just in the, uh, the pesticide in the rice fields, but it's used as a fumigant once you have the rice. Uh, when you have it in the big rice vats to try and protect it from getting mold. And so it's sprayed um, with a fungicide, if you will, that contains arsenic. And arsenic is very toxic, and the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has limits of how much we should be exposed to. And white rice uh, that's not organic, for example, uh, if you eat a half a cup a day of it, puts us over that EPA limit. And, which is pretty amazing. And other countries, for example, some countries in Europe have banned that and that they do not want arsenic being used in the rice and they'll actually test for it. But that, unfortunately, hasn't happened in the United States. Now, wow. when it's organic rice or some of the, for example, particularly the organic brown rice, that's different. They may not have the been sprayed with arsenic, but the regular rice has. And that's, you know, there are many cultures that eat rice on a daily basis. So how do we get rid of these toxins? I mean, I, I suspect we all have toxins, so measuring it may, might be a moot point. But how do we start releasing them to get them out of our system? 
Well, I think, for example, in the case of uh, mercury and having mercury fillings, I think it's important that we get it removed, but we get them removed properly. So we go to a dentist that knows just how to do it without causing more damage, uh, number one. And so we need to sort of educate our public and our patients about how important that is uh, because I still have, unfortunately, some colleagues or a dentist that will argue with me, you know, despite all the literature that we have. Um, but I think really the number one thing, Susan, is educating ourselves and realizing what can we do to prevent it? How can we assess how much exposure we're having? In other words, you know, how much non-caloric sweeteners do I, um, do I take in or have I taken in up until now? And uh, what about high fructose, fructose corn syrup? What other toxins am I exposed to? What prepackaged food do I eat? And what have I exposed my body to thus far? So what's my history? Where have I worked at? Where could I have had uh, my exposures? And then we add those things to our diet that are going to help us eliminate them. And then you can also do your tests, of course, with your doctor and do a detoxification program that's specific to you. But I think the way that I've always addressed this and what I have um, have yet to um, sort of found anything that tells me otherwise is to really try and increase our antioxidants. So the natural antioxidants in foods that will help us eliminate more and, and won't necessarily get us into detoxification crises. So really having a, a diet that's very colorful and from all colors of the rainbow, very high in vegetables, I would say you want 12, 10 to 12 servings of vegetables and fruit. And fruit, you know, if you're pre-diabetic or insulin resistant, then you want it to be just about two servings and you want it to be of the lower glycemic load, and such your berries, for example, or even some of the medium uh, load, like your apples and your banana. Um, not bananas. Bananas are high glycemic load. But like your apples and your pears and your oranges, and that you're eating them sort of during your meal as, in a sense, your dessert. Because Let me go back and define fruit, what glycemic what load is. That's just kind of what how big a sugar hit you get with a particular portion, correct? Uh, exactly. Sorry, I didn't mention that. Um, and so we want to try and give our body as much antioxidants as we possibly can. And in many cases, we have to supplement. But I believe we start off with diet, so a high-fiber diet, because fiber will help us detoxify, number one. And we want to add lots of color to our diet because those are all different phytonutrients that we're getting and uh, antioxidants. Of course, they're also going to feed um, our body, but are, are also going to help us eliminate some of these toxins. And then we want to, in addition, add some of the nutraceuticals or supplements that we know will help us detoxify um, even further. And then we can also be very specific once we know exactly what toxins we have. For example, for heavy metals, you might do more of one toxin than another. But I, I really believe in looking at food sort of as our, our foundation. We start there, but we also have to look at what else is going on with each of us in terms of stress is a toxin in the sense that it can create increased permeability in our gut. It can create leakiness. It can affect the gut microbiome, but it also affects our detoxification. And so, and, and it creates toxic chemicals in a sense that our body makes that then need to be detoxified. And so we really need to look at what else is going on and really look at lifestyle and what can we do to help our bodies detoxify in every way and lower sort of our, our stress because it, in a sense, we are all affected by stress, right? We're constantly living in a stressful world. We may not be able to change that, but we can change how we react to it. We can give our patients and ourselves sort of the tools that will help us deal with the stress better, right? There's, there's many different tools that we have at our disposal. And so I think that that's another way that we, when we're looking at insulin resistance, we have to address. And then you have, you can specifically give certain nutraceuticals that are going to address each individual problem or going to help each eliminate each individual toxin. The other thing, too, is, is using prebiotics and probiotics. So probiotics are basically the, some of the strains of bacteria that protect our gut microbiome. And we know that certain ones have been studied more and actually can help also reverse insulin resistance. And then prebiotics are sort of the food that feeds the good bacteria so that it can reproduce and grow. And we can add that. Many of those are fibers. We can add that to our patient's diet to help them 
you know, in this continuum and, and regress or reverse the insulin resistance. Okay. Um, we're winding down now. Can you mention like about 30 seconds on cal- caloric restriction? So there's some studies on, uh, that was one thing I, I forgot to mention actually, um, caloric restriction can also help with insulin resistance and even with a gut microbiome because each time that we eat, we're having some more toxins in a sense. We're having a toxin load uh, that our body needs to deal with. So the thought is um, there's two different ways. Uh, the, that I look at this. So um, there's intermittent fasting and then there's caloric restriction. And so we know that restriction, for example, um, calories can do it. I like working more at it from the angle of doing intermittent fasting because there's lots of literature on that and I find it much easier to implement with my patients. And so what I'll have them do is a 12, 14, or 16-hour fast, depending on how they're able to handle it, because some people who are insulin resistant may not be able to go very long without eating. So in those, you can restrict calories. I focus more at doing the intermittent fasting, and I'll work it into their schedule as much as I can, and I'll help them get there. So, so that for example, means, for example, say, we might stop eating like 6 in the evening and not eat until exactly. 10 o'clock the next morning? Exactly. So that's what I'll say. Maybe from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that's 12 hours. But most people maybe won't eat until 8. Well, that's 14 hours. And if you can do that two, three, four, five times a week, then you're already helping reverse your insulin resistance. Okay. Um, We have to wind down now. So let me summarize my understanding of some of these points. Uh, Sugar regulation is extremely important and affects many health conditions. Uh, We should minimize glucose spikes and dips. We can do this through, um, you know, keep a low glycemic load, which means if we do have a sugar hit and we really want to have that dessert, add some fiber to it, add some fats so it will even out the sugar uh, output. Also, genes uh, contribute to about 20% of our risk for diabetes. The rest is lifestyle choices. Thin people may get diabetes. Obese people may not. What we've learned from Dr. Houston is coronary vascular disease is based on a continuum of risk factors. Same goes for diabetes. A fasting blood sugar of 81 is where the risk for diabetes begins. A fasting blood sugar of 84 is where the risk factor for heart disease begins. You can reverse diabetes as with the heart disease. Studies show that lifestyle changes is more effective than metformin in preventing diabetes type 2. So what are the recommendations? Diet, organic whole foods, fiber, nuts, seeds, fermented foods. If you eat a sweet, lower your glycemic load by adding fat and protein. Avoid toxins, get out and move, and connect with the spiritual source and be happy. But I would like, uh, Dr. Trindati, can you tell us about your website for clinicians that want to learn more about this and you can help tutor them and guide them through this process? Uh, Sure. I just want to add one thing to your list. Uh, which I, I didn't mention much, and I talked about toxins uh, or dam- that damage the pancreas. And one thing, we talked about food sensitivities, but we didn't go into a lot of detail. But some of those are things like gluten, for example, or, or wheat and corn, soy, and milk. Those are things that we also need to consider, and you can have uh, our listeners can have their doctors look into that a little bit further. Now, okay. uh, my website is www.drtrindade.com. And what I've been doing is I've been developing a mentorship program where other docs who either have already started sort of widening their knowledge um, or are looking for someone to help with their patients, um, I will do that. Because it, it took a long time for me to sort of learn what knowledge I have and because I'm constantly and continually learning and then to try and apply it to my patients. And, and when I teach in the fellowship and at um, IFM, what I notice is that a lot of doctors will gain some of the knowledge, but then they're really hesitant or they don't know how to start. So I developed a mentorship okay. program where I can do that. Okay. I'm we're also going to be pretty, doing... Okay, yeah. Well, I, we're grinding down now. So I encourage you all to do your own research, to become informed so you can take care of yourself and others. Thank you for uh, joining us in this session. We got the power to change the world. Thank you for listening. Occupy Health with Dr. Susan Downs can be heard live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time and 11 a.m. Pacific Time on the Voice America Health and Wellness Channel. Here's to better health for you this week.